It's truly an honor and privilege to be here with you and to give you an overview of racism and its impacts on health around the globe. First, I want to begin by emphasizing that there are large racial ethnic differences in health in the United States, where I work, and around the world. So if you look at infant mortality, the chance of a baby dying before its first birthday, and this is data for the US, you can see that black, uh, Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islander populations, and American Indian and Alaska Native populations have higher rates of infant mortality than the white population. If you look at infant mortality for England and Wales, you can see that Pakistani, black African, Bangladeshi, black Caribbean, and Indian populations have higher rates of infant mortality than the white British population. If we go to Latin America and we look at the Afro-descended population in Latin, Latin America, you can see in Costa Rica, in Panama, in Uruguay, in Venezuela, in Brazil, in Ecuador, and in Colombia, the Afro-descended population have higher rates of infant mortality. Taken in Latin America, looking at the indigenous population in Latin America, you can see that in Costa Rica, Uruguay, Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, Venezuela, Peru, Ecuador, Panama, Guatemala, and Bolivia, the indigenous population have higher rates of infant mortality. Um, if we look at um, the indigenous populations and look at uh, life expectancy for men, the Maori in New Zealand, Aboriginal in Australia, uh, First Nation in Canada, Native American served by the Indian Health Service in the United States. In New Zealand, in Canada, and the United States, indigenous men live seven years shorter than the average population, and in Australia, the difference is three times larger. What drives these large racial inequities in health. And I've just given you a few examples. This is a global problem around the world. We see the pattern. Well, my first reaction would be at socioeconomic status, whether measured by income, education, occupational status, poverty, or wealth. Socioeconomic status is a profound determinant of health and of virtually every valuable resource in society. And guess what? Racial ethnic minority status is linked to socioeconomic status. So looking at Latin America, for example, the percent of the population in poverty by race and the Afro-descended population in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, um, Peru, and Uruguay have higher rates of poverty than the non-Afro-descended population. If you look in the United States, and I'm presenting median household income in a way you can't miss the point, standardizing on the income of whites as a comparison group. For every dollar of household income white households receive in the United States, Asian households receive a dollar and 23 cents. Asian households are more likely to be multi-generational to have more persons contributing to household income. But for every dollar of income white households receive, Hispanic households receive 73 cents, and American Indian or and black households receive 59 cents. What is stunning about a 59 cents figure for blacks in 2018 is that it's identical to the black-white gap in income in 1978. 1978 was the peak year of the narrowing of the black-white gap as a result of the anti-poverty policies and the civil rights policies of the 60s and 70s. And so the gap was narrowed to 59 cents in 78. And in 2018, it's still 59 cents. We have made less progress than most Americans, most of my students think we have made. There's been a lot of talk and assumptions about changes, but racial inequities in the United States has been on a treadmill. Lots of movement, but not making any progress. And large racial ethnic differences in income markedly understate the racial gap in economic status. What do I mean when I say that? Well, income captures the flow of resources into the household, salary and wages, for example, but it tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. We get that from data on wealth, the assets, the reserves, the savings, the investments that households have. And in the United States, for every dollar of wealth that white households have, black households have 10 cents and Latino households have 12 cents. The US is not unique. If you look wealth by ethnic group in England, for every pound of wealth the white majority has, 
Indians have 95 pence. Uh, Pakistan is 50p. Um, blacks from the Caribbean, 20. Um, blacks from Africa and Bangladeshi, 10p. Large differences in wealth. And when you are low in income and low in wealth, we may all be in the same storm of the pandemic, but we are in different boats. And some boats are better equipped to mesh to weather the storm and to survive the storm than others. When my career started, most researchers thought that racial ethnic differences in health was simply a function of the racial ethnic differences in socioeconomic status. And if you looked, for example, at blacks and whites at the same level of income and education, race would no longer matter. We now know that life is more complicated, and I will illustrate that by data on infant mortality by mother's education. In the United States, this is women with less than 12 years of education, you can see that black women and Native American or American Indian women have markedly higher rates of infant mortality. Among the, those who finish high school, 12 years of education, that pattern persists. Those with some college education, that pattern persists. And here is those with a college degree or more education. The black women with that level of education have the lowest level of infant mortality compared to black women with less education, but they still have infant mortality rates that are twice as high as all other college educated women. So there's something else about race that is mattering profoundly after we've taken income and education into account. And just to give you one example, the US is not unique. Look at data for Brazil. Again, infant mortality by mother's education. And for mothers with no years of education, black women have the highest rates. One to three years, black women still have the highest rates. Four to seven years, black women still have the highest rates. Eight or more years of education, black women still have the highest rates. So race still matters after we've taken uh, socioeconomic status into account. Well, what drives these racial inequities? And what does America think? drives these racial inequities. I'm going to show you national data from 2018 where we can find a substantial proportion of Americans, 45% of whites, 43% of Latinos, and 24% of blacks, feel that the problem is simply the laziness of blacks. Blacks are not working hard enough, and if blacks only worked harder, all the inequities would be solved. We see among the white population, among white men, and among whites with less than a college degree, 51% or more believe that it's just a problem of laziness. And if we look at the political party divide, 72% of Republicans compared to 23% of Democrats believe hard work alone would solve the problem. Well, is it just hard work? I and other scholars have been asking for 25 years, could racism be a critical missing piece of the puzzle to understand the patterning of racial inequities in health? And back in 1977, the book Black Power, uh, written by uh, activist Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, and political scientist Charles Hamilton, coined the term institutional racism to capture dimensions of racism that were built into the laws, practices, and culture of societies and institutions. In 1972, African-American social psychologist James Jones wrote a book about prejudice and racism, and he identified three aspects of racism personally mediated, internalized, and institutionalized. Uh, Joe Fagan, an uh, influential sociologist today, indicates that the original use of institutional racism captures what is now called structural racism and systemic racism. So these are the multi-dimensional aspects of racism that researchers have looked at. Back in 1997, I published a paper arguing that alongside with socioeconomic status, racism was a fundamental cause of racial inequities in health, and that racism was also a driver of the racial differences in socioeconomic status in the first place. So I want to talk to you today just about three dimensions of racism. 
structural or institutional racism, and I'll illustrate with the US data, residential segregation as a mechanism. I'll talk about individual discrimination in terms of interpersonal discrimination experienced by individuals, and cultural racism deeply embedded in stereotypes and stigma and implicit biases that shape the way in which we interact with each other and shape access to high quality uh, medical care. So I wrote a paper back in 2001 with Dr. Chiquita Collins arguing that residential segregation was a fundamental cause of racial inequities in health in the United States. And we're kidding ourselves if we think we can address the challenges of racism without addressing the problem of uh, residential segregation. So that's my view. What's the empirical evidence? What does the science really tell us? Uh, these are America's, two of America's most eminent sociologists, William Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson. They conducted a study of the 171 largest cities in the United States. And they found that because of residential segregation, there's not even one city in America where whites live under equal conditions to those of blacks. And that the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities. That's a 20 uh, uh, study goes back to 1995. What, what have we found since then? I want to talk about the work of Professor Dolores Acevedo Garcia at Brandeis University in the United States. She has created a neighborhood opportunity index, ranking every county in the United States on 29 different indicators of access to opportunity for children. Indicators like the quality of elementary schools and uh, high school graduation rate and the uh, home ownership rate and uh, the employment rate and the quality of the environment, the air, water, soil pollution, exposure to hazardous waste sites, and access to resources for, to, for health, like green space and healthy food outlets and safe places to walk. And then what she did in a paper published just in 2020, so this is recent data hot off the press, she looked at the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the United States. And she said, which children live in very low and low opportunity neighborhoods. And she found that 67% of all black children live in very low or low opportunity neighborhoods. And that's also true of 58% of Latino children and 53% of Native American children compared to just one in five white and Asian kids. And who lives in high opportunity neighborhoods? Almost two thirds of all white and Asian children and only about one in five black and Hispanic kids. So place and opportunity at a neighborhood level is a powerful driver of access to opportunity that shapes socioeconomic status and health. In fact, research finds that segregation is the central driver of large racial ethnic differences in income and education in the first place. I will share with you two studies, both from Harvard economists. This is David Cutler. Um, until recently, the Dean of the Social Sciences at Harvard University, one of the country's most eminent economists. He looked at national data for the United States. He shows statistically, with fancy econometric models I cannot even fully describe, but he shows that if you could statistically eliminate residential segregation in America, you'd completely erase black-white differences in income, in education, and in unemployment and reduce black-white differences in single motherhood by two-thirds. All of these large, striking differences are linked to opportunity at the neighborhood level. Rash Chetty, another Harvard economist, asked an intergenerational question using census data that is complete data for the United States. He said, let me look at black and white children who begin home life in homes where the parents have the same level of income. So he's statistically controlling for household income. How are the children doing in the next generation? And he finds that black boys earn less income than white boys in 99% of census tracts in America. Why? Because they're lazy? No, because they live in neighborhoods that differ in access to opportunity. Black boys do just as well as white boys if they live in neighborhoods with good resources, but those neighborhoods are rare 
in the United States. I have a relative who migrated from the West Indies to England several decades ago, and she has told me multiple times of looking for a flat in London and running into signs that said no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. After she passed away, her daughter wrote a book about her mother's life entitled No Blacks, No Irish, No Dogs. So even though the processes of segregation and the processes that shape access to inequality are not the same in uh, both the America and the UK, similar patterns exist. So if you look at the percentage of ethnic group living in the most deprived 10% of neighborhoods in England, you can see the overrepresentation of those same populations that have higher rates of illness. Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Black African, Arab, Black Caribbean are all overrepresented in the 10% most deprived neighborhoods in the United Kingdom. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the racial inequities in income and education that matter for life and health do not reflect a broken system. No, they reflect a carefully crafted system functioning as planned successfully implementing social policies, many of which are rooted in racism. These racial inequities do not reflect simply the behavior of individuals. They are not accidents. They are not acts of God. They illustrate the way in which these upstream mechanisms of racism has produced a truly rigged system. And research finds that when you are of low economic status and you have low wealth and you live in disadvantaged neighborhoods, it leads to higher levels of exposure and greater clustering of economic stresses, like difficulty making ends meet at the end of the month or being unemployed, psychosocial stresses like the death of a loved one, and physical and chemical stresses like exposure to air pollution. So I've talked about the ways in which upstream mechanisms of racism, such as residential segregation in the United States, shapes um, health. Well, experiences of individual discrimination can also be an added source of toxic stress. Many years ago, I developed scales to measure discrimination. One of them is called the Everyday Discrimination Scale. It does not capture all dimensions of discrimination, but it captures just the little indignities, being treated with less courtesy and respect than others, receiving poorer service than others at restaurants or stores, people acting as if they think you are not smart or they're afraid of you or they think you are dishonest or they are better than you are. These nine items have now been used in over 450 studies around the world in multiple countries. And everywhere we have looked at everyday discrimination, just one measure, there are lots of other measures of discrimination out there, but this is the most widely used scale in the literature today on discrimination and health globally, and we find it predicts health powerfully. Just to illustrate some of the examples, this slide will just in illustrate some outcomes that everyday discrimination is linked to. Higher levels of everyday discrimination is linked to incident, new cases of heart disease, of breast cancer, of type 2 diabetes. It's linked to behaviors that increase risk for a broad range of health outcomes. It's linked to multiple subclinical indicators of heart disease, like coronary artery calcification, heart rate uh, variation, uh, AFib. It's linked to higher levels of blood pressure among adults. It's linked to uh, poorer sleep duration and sleep quality. It's linked to higher levels of inflammation, stress hormones, shorter telomere length. Uh, it's linked in some studies to premature death. Exposure to these indignities are literally killing people prematurely. It's linked to obesity, uh, to weight gain, uh, to less Engagement with the healthcare system, low levels of falling through on your doctor's recommendations or cancer screening. It's linked to higher rates of mental disorders defined by DSM or scales of psychological distress or depressive symptoms. So a broad range of physical and mental health outcomes are now linked to exposure to racism. It's not that people just have a bad day, it's literally killing them prematurely. And the third mechanism of racism I want to talk about is racial bias in medical care. In 2003, there was a report uh, entitled Unequal Treatment, 
um, produced by the National Academy of Medicine, the highest medical authority in the United States, in response to a congressional request. And what that report found was across virtually every therapeutic intervention, blacks and other minorities in America receive poorer quality care than whites. Just to give you one example of a recent study that documents the persistence of this pattern, here is a 2020 study that looked at 1.8 million bir hospital births in the state of Florida over more than a decade, over two decades, and they found that when cared for by white doctors, black babies are three times more likely than white newborns to die in the hospital. This disparity is cut in half when black babies are cared for by a black doctor. So these are the challenges. What can we do? Strategy number one, building more health into the delivery of medical care is one of the things we need to do. What does that mean? Well, one strategy is to diversify the workforce to meet the needs of all patients. I want to share with you a high quality scientific study, randomized control trial, that took 1,300 black men in Northern California gave them a coupon to go to a Saturday morning clinic, and when they got to the clinic, they were randomized to be treated by a black doctor or by a doctor of a different race. Those black men who saw a black doctor were more likely to talk about other health problems, they were more likely to do the screening for the diabetes, more likely to take the flu vaccine, more likely to do the screening for cholesterol. So we saw greater engagement uh, with the healthcare system when there was racial concordance. I have some good news. Another study from Northern California found large racial disparities in the treatment of patients with HIV AIDS. However, the researchers found that although there was large racial disparities in this group in terms of taking the medication, in terms of falling through on the physician's uh, advice, and in terms of the medication working, when cultural competence was high, there were no racial disparities. Well, what was high cultural competence? Here are some items from the scale of cultural competence. It was providers who agreed that family and friends are as important to health as doctors, who said social history contributes to how they care for their patients, who said they are familiar with the lay beliefs their patients have, who said they asked their patients about alternative therapies they use, uh, who said that they find out what their patients think is the cause of their illness, who said they involve their patients in decisions about their health care. So what emerges here is a pattern of engagement, of listening, of respecting their patients, and under those conditions, regardless of race, there were no racial disparities in health. What else do we need to do? We need to build trust to improve patient-provider relationships and the quality of medical care. There are multiple determinants of mistrust. Um, misinformation, how populations have been treated historically and how they are treated currently in other social systems. Cultural distance between the provider and the patient. Mistrust is often viewed by, by healthcare providers as a characteristic of an individual or our, a community. But we need to rethink of mistrust as a phenomenon that is created, sustained, and reinforced by a system that generates social inequality. Risk mistrust, then, I am arguing, is a protective response of populations against interlocking systemic inequities in education, in jobs, in housing, in healthcare, and daily discrimination and stigma. It's a protective device. I want to illustrate with a recent study just published in the United States of the consequences of mistrust. This study, National Sample of Americans, 36% of blacks, 35% of Hispanics said they had experienced racism in healthcare in the last year. Among those who experience racism among blacks, those who experienced racism were less likely to said say, sorry, that they had a lot of trust in doctors, whether they were black or Hispanic. Those who experienced racism were also less likely to say that they were very satisfied with the care they had received. So the exposure to racism in the past year leads to less trust of the healthcare system and lower levels of satisfaction with healthcare. What else do we need to do? We need to provide care 
that addresses the social context. The World Health Organization asked the question, what do we accomplish if all we do is treat illness and send people back to live in the same conditions that made them sick in the first place? This is a report from the National Academy of Medicines in the United States that outlines multiple strategies for healthcare systems and health professionals to address the social needs of their patients. I want to give you a couple quick examples. There's a long history of doing this. This is Dr. Jack Geiger, who passed away recently in the United States. He founded two medical organizations that both won a Nobel Peace Prize, but he started a community health center movement in the United States and in the second community health center in Mississippi in 1966. He would write prescriptions for malnourished black children in Mississippi, and those prescriptions would be filled at local grocery stores but paid out of the pharmacy budget of the healthcare center because providing good food is part of good medical care. An example from London, Tower Hamlets, um, has been using social prescribing. Social prescribers are link workers based in GP practices who help patients with non-medical issues and facilitates their access to appropriate support. I'm 25 minutes into my talk. I have five more minutes to go. These include volunteering, employment benefits. Now, I, I have it with my phone here telling me my time. Um, in 2016, there's a rollout of social prescribing across the borough and social prescribers being provided in each of 10 GP practices. What else can we do? Strategy number two is to create communities of opportunity to minimize, neutralize, and dismantle the systems of racism that create inequities in the first place. We need to think outside of the healthcare system and think of how we can enrich the quality of neighborhood environments, facilitate economic development in poor areas, improve housing quality, and the safety of neighborhood environments. So communities of opportunity means to invest in early childhood programs. The foundations of health in adulthood are laid in childhood. We need to reduce childhood poverty. We need to enhance income and employment opportunities for youth and young adults, improving neighborhood and housing conditions, enhancing economic opportunities are all strategies that we have to implement uh, to create these communities of opportunity. I want to give you a few quick examples of the kinds of things that can be done by illustrating innovative solutions. The Boston Medical Center, the safety net medical facility in Boston area, has transformed its roof into a rooftop farm to address problems of food insecurity in the community to help patients and their families, employees, and visitors. A hospital transforming its farm, its, its roof into a farm, to address problems in the community. Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, an example of a comprehensive approach to reducing health inequalities um, by saying this hospital is seeking to reduce the gap between the poor neighborhoods that it serves and the wealthy neighborhoods, the gap in life expectancy, by 50% in 10 years. And what are they doing? They have become an engine of economic investment in the community, providing employment preferences to local people, using local labor, developing career ladder opportunities, starting with kids in high school and summer programs, giving them jobs within the healthcare system, purchasing their supplies locally, providing financial education to the community, a comprehensive approach of a healthcare system to improve the health. Why do we need to act now? We cannot afford to pay the multiple cost of societal racism. In the United States, when I say there are racial differences in health, I'm referring to the fact that over 200 black people die prematurely every day. Imagine a fully loaded jumbo jet taking off with over 200 passengers and crew and dying every day and crashing every day and everybody on board dying. That's what happens in America when we say there are racial inequities in health. And poor health has enormous economic cost. It's been calculated if we could eliminate racial inequities in the US by 2050, 
there would be an additional $8 trillion in U.S. GDP annually, an additional $3 trillion in earnings, an additional $2.6 trillion in consumer spending. Racial inequities have enormous costs. And finally, the final cost is what is it doing to our children? A study in the United States of suicide found that the suicide among elementary school children was stable between 1993 and 2012, but that masked the fact that suicide rates had doubled for black children. And why have they doubled for black children? They've doubled before cause a study published in May Black children are reporting higher levels of discrimination, which is linked to higher suicide. What's holding us back? We need to raise awareness. We need to build political will. We need to build empathy. I leave you with two quotations. Martin Luther King said, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It understands that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. And the words of the late Senator Robert Kennedy in Cape Town, South Africa in 1966, he said each time a man or woman stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples can build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. It is my hope that each one hearing my voice today would make a commitment to be a tiny ripple of hope. And together, we can sweep down the mighty walls of oppression and resistance. Thank you very much.